Good morning. Welcome to the worship of God at First Baptist Church on this seventh Sunday after Epiphany. We just keep rolling right along. Uh, it is summer in Middlesboro, in case you hadn't noticed. Uh, not you. Uh, <laughs> sorry. It is summer in Middlesboro, and we're glad you're here, even if you could be, you know, at the lake or gardening or any of the number of things you could be doing. But we're glad you're here today. If you're a guest and you feel inclined, feel free to drop a card out of the pew rack in the offering plate as it comes by. Uh, that'll help us connect with you. A few announcements uh, to highlight out of the inside and the back of your order of worship. Uh, there's, a, there's a list of things that I uh, won't hit all of them, but, uh, but in the name of David Mike, I will remind you, Brotherhood, that the Brotherhood meets uh, tomorrow, tomorrow night, 6 o'clock, and that the Middlesboro High School baseball coach is speaking. Skipping down, uh, you'll see that uh, there's a reminder in bold for all the newsletter folders to show up on Thursday at 11 and help Tina fold the newsletter so it can be mailed out on time. Then, uh, then, <laughs> then next, uh, next Sunday is Transfiguration Sunday. And uh, Transfiguration Sunday is the last Sunday before we enter into the season of Lent. And you'll also notice that the Reverend Christy Bay will be preaching next Sunday. Uh, she will be the Martha Stearns Marshall preacher. Uh, Martha Stearns Marshall was a famous, or infamous maybe, uh, female Baptist preacher of the 1800s. And Christy will be standing in that lineage next Sunday. Then all the way down, you'll notice uh, Ash Wednesday service uh, is Wednesday, the March the 1st. So that's not this Wednesday, but the next one. And that's at 6.30. Dinner is at 6. Y'all come. You're welcome. Um, then two more announcements I'll let you read on your own. Uh, one on the back, one on the inside. Uh, but we celebrate uh, those two good things as well. Today we continue and uh, kind of wrap up our, uh, our look through the Sermon on the Mount. Today we'll deal with another set of Jesus' teachings from that. Uh, listen, listen for those as they come by in, in all the various elements of worship that we have. And of course I'll be uh, preaching from the Gospel of Matthew uh, in just a little bit. Why don't you guys uh, stand up, get the blood circulating, and greet the people around you. Love divine, all loves excelling. Hymn number 281 is our hymn of praise this morning as we stand and raise our voices.
Let's pray. God, our creator, you are love. You are greater than all we can fathom. We come today to worship you, and we want to be lost in wonder, in love, and in praise, and to be your new creation. Accept the praise we bring this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you take your worship bulletin? Let's read together our litany of invitation and confession. God's spirit dwells in us, for we are God's temple. We belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. Praise the Lord. God declares to be God's beloved. You shall be holy, for I, your God, am holy. Trust in divine mercy. We confess our faults before God and one another. Almighty oh God, your law shows the way of righteousness. But we forsake your commandments. Too often we fail to provide for the poor or to care for the disabled. Sometimes we have not been truthful in our daily business. We have been unjust in our judgment of others. We admit that we have sought revenge against our enemies, and we have not always loved our neighbors as ourselves. Forgive us these sins, O oh God and rouse us to sincere repentance. Liberate us to fullness of life as your holy people. Friends, God is both just and merciful. God offers us the law that we might be free of our own vanities and impulses. We are forgiven. We are called to the fullness of life. Let us lift our voices in thanks and praise to God. <coughs> God's law is offered to Moses for God's people. Threads of grace are woven throughout the commands and proclamation. A reading from the book of Leviticus. You always wanted to hear from Leviticus. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall not strip your vineyard bare or gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. You shall not steal, you shall not deal falsely, and you shall not lie to one another. And you shall not swear falsely by my name, profaning the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not defraud your neighbor. You shall not steal, and you shall not keep for yourself the wages of a laborer until the morning. You shall not revile the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind. You shall fear your God. I am the Lord. You shall not render an unjust judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. With justice you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not profit by the blood of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. You shall reprove your neighbor, or you will incur guilt yourself. 
You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Here ends the first lesson. If you would, ready your heart, ready your mind and your spirit to pray with me. Almighty God, we are grateful for the privilege that it is to gather here on Sunday morning. We are grateful for our friends and family who sit in the pews in the choir loft around us. We're grateful for this bizarre weather and the easy winter that it has been so far. God, we're grateful most of all uh, for the example and the hope that is Jesus Christ, who guides us and calls us and supports us as we try to live a life, like Leviticus said, that is pleasing to you. God, there are many people in the world who are hurting today and every day. You know them better than we, and we ask that you will tend to them and help us to tend to them as you would have us to do as your church. And God, even as we try to do what seems to be a giant task in that, we know that we must keep praying. We know that we probably must keep praying without ceasing. So we begin again this morning on this Sabbath day, God, by joining our voices together and praying boldly, in unison, the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Jesus teaches the spirit of God's law over and against the letter of it, offering a subversive way to live with greater freedom in the midst of a broken world. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. If anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You've heard it said, love your, enemy, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your father in heaven. And he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even, even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Here ends the gospel lesson. And our hymn of stewardship in your hymnal, number 629, Be Strong in the Lord. Let's stand. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, everything we are and everything we have is your gift. And after having created us, you have given us the greatest of all gifts, your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Amen, indeed. Amen. And it is, uh, it is good to be here today. It's good to have Madison pray. It's good to have the choir and the organ and the piano. It's good to have all of you here singing as well. Which brings me to the sermon. Uh, it, uh, it, you read this gospel lesson, and you read it, and you read it, and you say, what in the world can you say about that? You know, it ends, be perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. Well, I guess we should go on to La Esperanza. Uh, there's not, not much else to say than that, right? Just wrap it up. Well, it's the job of the preacher, no matter what the text, to carry on. And it's the job of the people in the pews as well to carry on, even when we get a text that is a little bit hard to figure out. I want to begin this way today um, with some discussion on biblical literalism. Biblical literalism. There is, and I suppose there always has been, a great deal of talk and debate and argument about taking the Bible literally. You've no doubt heard it before. What begins as a well-intentioned attempt to take the Bible seriously veers off course and becomes a debate about important sounding things like the authority of Scripture or the veracity of Scripture or most commonly the inerrancy of Scripture. I believe the Bible, the inerrantist says, I take it literally, what it says is what it means. <laughs> can, can you imagine, though, if someone tried to take this passage in Matthew literally? You heard it read earlier. You heard how it ends. Can you imagine what it would look like? Tom Long, one of my favorite preachers who I've quoted a lot recently, uh, points out or says, he says it this way. It boggles the mind, of course, to think about living this example literally in contemporary society. Imagine a Christian in New York City who got up one morning and decided to do what Jesus says here, to turn the other cheek, to give to every beggar, and to respond to every lawsuit by settling outside of court for double the amount. This person would be broke, homeless, and very likely in the emergency room at Bellevue Hospital by noon. Literal does not work with this passage. It doesn't work on many passages of the Bible. Even worse, the literal reading can sometimes bring about exactly the opposite effect that the text intends. Take, for instance, a wife who is a victim of an abusive husband. If she were to turn to the Bible for help or reassurance and to read Matthew 5.39 literally, what do you think would happen? She turns to the scripture for support, for liberation, and she finds the words, Jesus' words, but I say to you, do not resist an evildoer, but if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. She reads that passage literally well. Or what about a poor man plagued with a moderate uh, case of physical disability who receives a disability check and turns to the Bible for help in deciding how God would have him to use that money. He reads the word, Jesus' words, if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak also. 
or maybe give to everyone who begs from you, and do not refuse anyone who borrows or wants to borrow from you? And suppose this man's brother is a drunk or a drug addict who always comes asking. If this man were to read this passage literally, well, or what about a soldier whose country is endangered and engaged in a clearly defensive war against a vastly superior empire? He is plagued with all the hopes and fears that even a war for survival brings with it. He turns to his Bible for aid in sifting and sorting through all of that and reads these words, Jesus' words. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. You know, if he reads that last part, that part about the sun and the rain, literally, he might get the idea that God is indifferent to his situation. I believe the Bible, the inerrantist says. I take it literally. What it says is what it means. What if that kind of reading actually leads to the exact opposite effect that the text intends? Today, I want to spend some time talking uh, or taking Matthew 5, 38 through 5, 48, not literally, but taking it seriously. I want to spend some time not taking it literally, but taking it seriously. I borrow this helpful distinction from a great theologian, a young adult author named Madeline L'Engle. Some of you know Madeline L'Engle. When asked about biblical literalism several, several years back, L'Engle said poignantly, well, I take the Bible far too seriously to take it all literally. I take the Bible far too seriously to take it all literally. I like to think that on my good days, I do the same. So here goes. The end of Matthew 5, that is the gospel lesson for the day, brings to an end the first section of the Sermon on the Mount. I remember in seminary learning about the writings of a particular scholar who really compelled me forward on this passage. The scholar's name is Walter Wink. Walter Wink was a United Methodist preacher and professor, served most of his career at Auburn Theological Seminary in New York City. In all that I have read, which admittedly isn't a lot, I'm only 32, but in all that I have read, when it comes to Matthew 5, 38 through 48, nobody hears this passage quite like Wink does. With respect to especially this passage of scripture, Walter Wink gets very, very curious. And you know, curiosity is a spiritual virtue. He gets very, very curious and takes his curiosity to this passage. He keeps asking questions. He keeps turning the passage again and again, trying to take in all of its angularity, all of its complexity. Curiosity helps Wink come up with a very interesting way of hearing Jesus' words here. Wink's curiosity leads him to take these teachings, these three teachings at the beginning, one by one. And he begins, of course, with the first one. 
turn the other cheek. If anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. Many biblical commentators correctly hear this passage as a, as a warning about returning violence for violence. It's pretty clear that Jesus didn't believe in that. And most of the biblical commentators that I've read, they're pretty good at picking up on Jesus saying, don't repay violence with violence. But then they move on. Not Walter Wink. Walter Wink's curiosity makes him ask a question that I didn't know to ask until I read it in his book. He says simply, why the, why the right cheek? Why the right cheek? If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. Wink finds the answer in historical documents and practices of the Roman world in which Jesus lived and taught. That Roman world was governed by what we would call a strict honor code. A strict honor code. Now, to put this in perspective, if you're a Star Trek fan, uh, think of the Klingons. You know, the Klingons, an honor code. Or if you're a Star Wars fan, maybe, think of the Jedi. But think of the Jedi not in Luke's story. Go back before that when they were powerful and had their temple and, and they were a little bit blind to their position in the world around them. And uh, just to be fair, if you're not a geek like I am, and you're looking for something to help you out of this hole that I just put in front of you, perhaps you could recall uh, a class you once took on history, and you can think of knights and damsels in medieval Europe. Maybe you can grab onto that one. In all of these things, the Klingons, the Jedi, and medieval Europe, honor was of utmost importance. If you were a person with a privileged position in an honor society, you held on to that honor by acting a certain way. That way was prescribed for you and by you, your peers and probably your king or queen or ruler. And the last thing you wanted to do was to act like a peasant. You're a knight, you're a noble, you're a lady, you're a lord, and you need to act like it. For the minute you stop, you lose honor. Some of the ways that honor uh, existed in medieval Europe, uh, anybody been to the Renaissance Festival? I see a few hands. The Renaissance Festival. Well, the Renaissance Festival it kind of recreates some of those honor rituals, those ways of, of carving out the pecking order with the jousting and the sword play and the honor that comes with victory and the shame that comes with defeat. This is the world that Jesus offers this teaching in, this honor coded culture. And in that recognition, Wink asked his question, why the right cheek? If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. Well, some of the historical documents that he mines through, uh, they talk about Roman honor culture. They talk about how important handedness was in ancient Rome. Handedness. The right hand was the hand that you used for noble deeds. Jesus sits at the right hand and the disciples want to sit at the right hand. The right hand was the one used for noble deeds. The right hand was for clean things. But the left hand Left hand was not for clean things. The left hand was for the unclean things. 
And you didn't mix these two hands up, at least not in public, you didn't. So why the right cheek? Well, Wink goes on and on about this a little bit. He talks about how you might strike somebody on the right cheek and what you could do. You could, you could hit them open-handed or you could hit them with a closed hand. You could hit them with your right hand or your left hand. But if the left hand is for unclean, dishonorable things, then you wouldn't use the left hand at all. You would use the right hand. And there's only one way, really, to strike somebody on the right cheek with the right hand. It's with the back of your hand, like that. Now, I think this is fascinating exegesis here, with the back hand. And Wink then points out, what would happen if you turned the other cheek toward the person that was trying to humiliate you? with this back hand. Well, they wouldn't be able to do it. They would have to use their left hand, which they can't do, or they would have to hit you with a fist, which then is an equals thing. You know, you you fist fight. That's an equals. That's what soldiers did with soldiers. You don't do that with peasants if you're nobility. That's not how it works. Walter Wink's conclusion after studying this and looking at the penalties in the Dead Sea Scrolls for using your left hand in combat, you know you can go to jail for 10 days for that in Rome. His, his, uh, his kind of deduction after all this is that turning the other cheek is actually a form of resistance. It's actually a way to get somebody to break their habit of humiliation to a lower class person. Keep in mind, Jesus is preaching the Sermon on the Mount. All the people that are around him, well, they're, they're fishermen. They're workers, shepherds, they're peasants. They live under occupation of this Roman world, and Jesus says, turn the other cheek, And they hear it. They hear it for what it is. Resistance. Resistance. Turn the other cheek, Jesus says. It's not about being a doormat. It's about resisting evil. The second teaching reads, If anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give them your cloak also. Now, if you didn't hear kind of how comical that was from the start, let me read it again. If someone sues you and wants to take your jacket, give them your shirt also. Wink looks into the history of this, and he recognizes that all these people that are standing in front of Jesus as Jesus gives this sermon, well, they're they're fishermen, they're shepherds, they're peasants. And peasants in the Roman world were often the people that got sued for their clothing because they didn't have anything else. So they show up in court. They're being sued for their coat. And Jesus says, give them your shirt also. You see it yet? This is a spectacle. This is a spectacle. This is... You know, when you get to court and the justice isn't there, parade around in your birthday suit. It's okay to laugh at that. It's kind of funny. But it's right there. Now, that might not be such a big deal. It might be something that's a little bit too big a deal. Uh, But either way, if you remember the story of Noah, nakedness was not just something that you know, was okay. And if you remember the story of Noah, you remember that it it was his son Ham who was disgraced. Not Noah, his son Ham, who saw him that way. If someone is suing you for your coat, give them your cloak also. 
What a spectacle that would be. I can hear the crowd on the hillside snickering as Jesus teaches this. I can hear the soldiers that are standing over to the side going, what's so funny? I don't get it. That's a stupid teaching. If anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give them your cloak also. Give them your cloak also. It's not about being a doormat. It's about resisting evil. The third teaching reads, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. When taken seriously instead of literally, this passage seems to be talking about a common Roman law. The law, many of you might already know this, has to do with the Roman soldier's ability to give that 60 or 80 pound pack of gear to a civilian or a peasant to carry for them. And this law is almost a, a merciful law in Roman code. I mean, you can only impose one mile, only one. But Jesus says, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. I can hear the Roman soldiers on the hill over there going, yeah, I like this guy. That's great. And I can hear the crowd going, that's pretty good. For you see, to go the second mile would make the Roman soldier break the law. To go the second mile, to be kind of cheeky about it, to use a bad pun on a Matthew lesson, to be a little cheeky about it, all of a sudden the Roman soldier comes back to take his pack and you go, oh no, sir, please let me carry this another mile for you. Well, that's not the way it works, peasant. Well, well, I insist. I insist on carrying this another mile. All of a sudden, all the officers in the brigade or in the troop there are looking on going, this isn't right. This isn't how this is supposed to work. The power has shifted. Go also the second mile. It's not about being a doormat. It's about resisting evil. To take these three teachings literally means to be frustrated when they do not speak to the complexity and the hardship of our human life. But to take them seriously, as Wink does, to approach them with curiosity and patience, is to hear the truth that is buried in each one of them. A literal reading would have you be a doormat. It would have you hear Jesus tell the abused, abused wife to hunker down and to put up with it. It would have you hear Jesus tell the poor man to give up that which he so desperately needs. It would have you hear Jesus tell that soldier that God doesn't care about this. Move on. But a serious reading, a serious reading would mean to hear the gospel in light of the hardest situations that our experience can muster. A serious reading would hear you tell, uh, would hear Jesus tell the woman, resist this. It's not okay, and it's not who I created you to be. A serious reading would have us hear Jesus tell that poor man, resist this. You need those basic things to live your life today. A serious reading would hear Jesus say to that soldier, resist this. I do care about you just as I care about them. 
You are all my children. All includes you, too. Literal doesn't get it here, but serious and curious does. The literalist hears Jesus at the very beginning of this passage say, Do not resist an evildoer, and resigns himself, says, Evil happens. This is the way it is. Just have to let it be what it is. But the serious reader of the Bible, the curious reader of the Bible, she hears Jesus say, tongue firmly in cheek. But I say to you, do not resist evil. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give them your shirt too. If anyone forces you to walk a mile, go also the second mile. It'll be fun. The literalist will miss that, but not you. Not you. No, you won't miss that because you, like Madeline LaEngel, you take the Bible far too seriously to take it all literally. Amen. We've come to our time of invitation, and you are invited. You are invited to consider and be shaped by the teachings of Jesus. You are invited uh, to be a member of this church if you are being led to be so. And you are invited to stand and to sing praises to God. Let's do that now.
And now as you prepare to go from this place, hear this benediction, this good word. Depart now in the fellowship of God the Creator. And as you go, remember, by the grace of God, you were born into this world. By the strength of God, you have been kept all the day long, even until this very hour. And by the love of God, that love best revealed in the face of Jesus, you are being redeemed. And that is good news. Amen. Thank you.